Hi, I'm Peggy at Headshots by Peggy, and today we have Stephen Tobolowski with us. Stephen, it has been a pleasure for me to read your books. You have led an amazing life. Well, I, I, I think everybody's led an amazing life. I, I, I think the problem is a lot of times people forget their lives. That's a good point. Very quickly they forget their lives. I think Merrick and I talked about this the other day is being more um, thankful for today. I mean, we are big at pushing for tomorrow, but being thankful for today is, sometimes we forget that. Yeah, well, I, I think what happens is we're always aware of the deficits. Right. Very much, and, and not only the real deficits, but the imaginary Very deficits ones. that are around the corner. And, and, and we are consumed by that kind of worry, and that, and that kind of worry keeps us not only from not achieving anything in the present, but it, it keeps us from being creative, really. That's, that's a good point. Now, I read, I read both of your books, but I read your, your first one last and your last one first. Excellent, that's, that's um, good. So, but, but you need to tell people about your acting. Like, really quick, just, I mean, your, um, your acting school was, testimony enough that you were going to be successful. I mean, the, that, that was the most insane story. Well, I, I, you were kicked out, you were kicked out of acting she, school. She, not, not really. <laughs> now, she's referring to college, to college, uh -huh. when I was in college at SMU. And uh, my roommate, Jim McClure, at the time said something during that horrific period of time is that you are the most vulnerable you ever are in your life when you go to college. Because your entire life, you as a person have been protected by grown-ups. Right. And now you go to college, you are not. You, you have pretty much the body and the kind of ambition of a grown-up. But you don't have any of the wisdom of a grown-up. And you... You walk into the airplane propeller almost every day. Yeah. Like I always assumed that a teacher would be interested in teaching me. <laughs> and, and I always assumed that a teacher would, would always want my, my best interests at, in her heart. But in my school at SMU, Dallas, Texas, uh -huh. uh, which at that time was one of the top five drama schools in the country, yeah. I had no idea. I only went there because I only applied to one school. <laughs> I, I went to SMU because my dad went to SMU. Yeah. And I applied on the last day, got into drama school. And uh, it was the first day of my sophomore year. And I'll try to make this quick. It was the first day of my sophomore year. And we had a new drama teacher, Joan Potter. And everybody was eager to make her, yeah. your friend, you yeah. know, it, it was a big deal. This was huge in a, a drama school. And my faculty advisor, Bernard Hopgood, wanted me as a sophomore to audition with the freshmen, freshman auditions. Well, that was beneath me at that point of being 19 years old and a sophomore. But I thought what he wanted me to do was to liven up the evening. <laughs> like, because you had this endless group of freshmen auditioning, how boring is that? I remember my freshman audition, it was very boring. Uh, <laughs> so I thought I would do the same audition I did as a freshman, but I would do it as a strip tease. <laughs> so <laughs> I did Orlando from uh, As You Like It, and as I spoke, I you... took off. <laughs> and, and the audience was like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up in uh, boxer shorts with high hob, written in magic marker on my butt, and I got up and I turned around and I mooned the audience and danced off stage. And I mean, the audience loved it. They loved it. it. I am not kidding. There were hoots, hollers, pitching of pennies. It was, I thought, I have nailed this one, kids. That is how you do an audition. Well, apparently, no. one of the people in the audience 
was not impressed with my audition, and that was our... The one you were trying to impress. Yeah, Joan Potter. I thought I, was, <laughs> I, thought I had her in my hip pocket at this point. Well, uh, the first paper I had to do in Joan Potter's class uh, was to work on a scene and describe how we arrived at our truth. I had no idea what any of those words meant. Arrived at our truth. Mystery to me. <laughs> to me, I was from high school. You know, I always played the leads in high school plays. You memorize the lines and you get up there and you do an accent and you put streaks and tips in your hair and this was your character. So uh, I did a character from Catcher in the Rye and Joan gave me back a paper and F. And F. It was the only time in my... I was a good student. I was a straight A student. Only time in my life I ever got an F with the words on top saying... Talk to me after class. And she handed me my paperback, and I, I was terrible. And she was shaking with rage. And everybody left, and they were looking at me there. I'm standing on stage with Joan Potter. And she says, are you making fun of the process? And I didn't know, again, I any write. word what, what she meant. I didn't know making fun of the process, had no idea what the process was. I go, no ma'am, no. I, I'm not, I knew I knew to say no. I, I, I was an A student, I knew to say no. No ma'am, no, I'm not making it. She says, because I won't have it. I won't have it in this class. I go, no ma'am, you shouldn't have it. You shouldn't have it, no. I'll redo this paper and I'll make it a really good paper. Well, as it turned out, that was the beginning of my trail of tears in school. Joan Potter did almost everything she could in her power to get me thrown, well, certainly out of the department. Uh -huh. she, she achieved that. Right. She got me thrown out of the uh, being an acting major yeah. right after that first year. Uh, it only took one vote from any of the major faculty members to get someone blackballed, and so she threw me out. But what I did was... And this is what... I thought. This is what I did, and it's a lesson for everyone. Anyway, I went into my little room, and I sat on my bed, not knowing what to do, that I was thrown out of the drama department. And I think I must have, and I'm not exaggerating, I think I sat in silence in my room for at least two hours, because the sun started to set <laughs> in absolute silence. And suddenly, I get this voice in my ear of a quotation I remember from Sunday school from uh, the great Jewish teacher and thinker Hillel, who, exist, who lived about the same time Jesus did, uh -huh. to get that historical perspective, you know, about zero A.D., uh -huh. B.C., that kind of juncture. And his quotation was, if I am not for myself, who is? If I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? Mm. Now, me being me, again, I had no idea what that last <laughs> part meant. If not now, when? You know, if not now, when? Uh, and it's pretty complicated if you start to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it came to me that Joan Potter had given me the gift of when. I knew when was now. Yeah. Now was when. So what I did was, even though I was thrown out of the department, I marched down to the registrar's office and I signed up for my junior year every acting class in the professional acting curriculum I wanted to take even though I had been thrown out of the department. Uh -huh. When I arrived in Joan Potter's class, <laughs> The first day of my junior year, she almost had a stroke, seeing me sitting in her class. She gave us our first assignments, assigning scene partners and who we're going to study uh, and whatever, and she passed me by. And she said, does anyone have questions? I raised my hand. She looked through me, you know, not there, not there. I started going into different classes in the professional acting curriculum, and the other teachers were looking at me like, what is this guy doing here? We kicked him out last year. What is he doing here? My uh, advisor, Bernard Hopgood, he, he used to give me advice always in the men's room. 
I don't know. It, it just happened to be in between the acting classes and the uh, theater history department was the men's room. So he would always intercept me in between those two places and pull me into the men's room to give up. He was furious. He said, I need to talk to you in my office now. And uh, I'd never seen Hobbes so mad. He was bald like I am now. Then I had hair, but he was bald. So his whole head had turned red, red. like a thermometer. So he pulled me into his office, closed the door, started thinking of what he was going to say. And he said, Stephen, the classes of the professional acting curriculum are not an option for you. This is not the way I wanted it, but that's the way it is. I'm sorry, you have to understand that if we allow you to take these classes without being a part of the program, we won't be able to control who takes our classes in the future. I'm sure you understand that. I'm sorry. And I let that sit like a poison gas on a World War I battlefield, just right there. And I go, ha, I have a different perspective on this. Uh, I appreciate your point of view, but I don't work for you. You work for me. You see, I paid my tuition for my junior year. You accepted, the registrar's office accepted my check of tuition. So I'm partially paying your salary and I'm partially paying Joan Potter's salary and Jack Clay's salary. So I will be in those classes. And uh, again, huh? I'm sorry. And I left. The next several weeks, teachers would not give me assignments. I was not cast in any plays. And I still showed up. <laughs> That's important. That's important. I still showed up. And that probably was your best acting lesson in your life. Or, or uh, the, <laughs> the, the ability to um, delude oneself. Yeah, yeah I, I, I kept, <laughs> That's what it is. I kept a self-delusion. I kept showing up, yeah. even though I wasn't given assignments, I would do all my papers and I would get them back not graded. I did tests in Joan Potter's class. She handed me back my test. No grade on it. Nothing. Nothing. No grade on the test. Um, I remember um, I got this terrorized feeling. You know, I knew things were going south. So I asked the theater history teacher, what, what were the requirements to graduate from school? And uh -huh. he said, well, you need to take a certain number of classes and grades, and you have to pass the comprehensive examination uh -huh. uh, at the end of your senior year. And I thought, is there any rule about not taking the comprehensive examination early? He says, no, there's nothing in the bylaws of the theater department. You take it any time you want. I said, I want to take that test now. I want to take that test now. Do you give it? He says, well, I'm going to give it in like six weeks. I said, I said, listen, you put my name on that list to take that test, that graduate test, even though I was right. at the beginning of my junior year. I said, you put my name, but don't have my name on any list. Don't tell anyone in the faculty I'm taking this test. I said, you cannot tell anyone, not your family or friends. And, and this guy was terrorized. It was the closest he had ever been to being in a James Bond movie. That's funny. So I studied for the next month. I took the graduate exam a year and a half early uh, in secret. <clears throat> uh huh. And then I. Uh, and it turned out it was a good thing. I passed. I passed. <laughs> and as, as it turned out, when. Uh, I was going to graduate. There's an, another extra thing I do have to tell in this story is that one of the mysteries about this whole thing was that Joan Potter in all of her classes gave me A's. 
even though she didn't grade your papers, didn't assign you anything. Gave me A's. And I'm thinking like, oh, well, things aren't that bad. You know, that's okay. So she treats me poorly. And then I got a terrible feeling. I was always a good student. Uh -huh. Artificially low grades in would've... her class would have tipped off everybody, uh -huh. like the, the faculty and advisors and my family. Uh -huh. A lot of lawyers in my family. <laughs> that something untoward was going on in the theater department at SMU. Lawsuits. Right. So I'm thinking, if she really had dark designs on me, the perfect cover for her is to give me right. straight A's. And the final hatchet came down upon my virtual neck near the end of my senior year, where uh, my advisor... Bernard Hopkins told me sadly that I had been gotten a second unsatisfactory critique. The first one was when they kicked me out of the uh, apartment. Right, right. The second one, Joan Potter. And gave, this is at the very end of senior year. At the year. very end, after all the exams and everything, before the comprehensive exam uh -huh. is given. And so Hobb told me now that I had two unsatisfactory critiques, according to the rules of the theater department, I was officially no longer a student of that department, and I... Um, so you were going to lose all your credits? Everything. everything. Going to lose the credits and not be able to graduate uh -huh. because of Joan Potter. And I told Hobbit, because I would not be allowed to take, take the, the comprehensive test. exam. I said, well, Hobb, I already took the comprehensive. He goes, well, that's impossible. We give it next week. <laughs> I said, no. I took it a year and a half ago with Tony Graham White, the theater history teacher. Ask him, he has my paper. Hop called Tony, and a minute later, Tony, <laughs> Tony, Tony came walking down into the office with a sealed envelope with my test in it, graded by him, shown that it was like untampered with and handed it to Hob. I had made something like 102 on the test because I got the extra credit extra question, credit. right? <laughs> so not only did I graduate from SMU, I graduated first in my class from SMU because of all the A's Joan Potter gave, gave me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joan. <laughs> but and there was, was no happy ending to this story. No, she, no. You never figured it out. I, I never figured out why she did it. In fact, a few years later, I was doing my first Broadway uh -huh. show Joan came to my first Broadway show and came backstage to see me and stuck her head into my dressing room and said, you're still no good. <laughs> this is what I learned from Seneca. It is always good to have an adversary. Yeah. Because if you go through life untried, you never know what your potential was. So I... Do this toast to Joan, wherever <laughs> she may be, and saying, because of your mental cruelty, because of creating situations that I've rarely seen, even working with network television people. Right. She was devious uh, in, in her treatment of me. Uh, she made me a better and stronger person. It isn't, we aren't forged by our goals and dreams and desires. We are forged by our obstacles. It is, it is our difficulties that make us who we are. And so we need to cherish our difficulties. I, I agree with that. I think that um, if you can't handle if you can't handle an obstacle, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to handle success because success will is be, an obstacle. Is, it will be your obstacle. Well, success is an obstacle. It success. Um, and I've had limited success, but I've had more success in my life than I ever expected. I mean, I still have a career. I, you are everywhere. I, I, I still have a career, but success is an obstacle because it separates you uh -huh. from the world. Uh, the world is constantly living in this boiling pot uh -huh. of discomfort and dissatisfaction and dreams not coming true. Uh -huh. And when they see someone who is successful, 
there is a great deal of jealousy and envy and you become separated. You can't really, you know, I, I learned early on that when another actor says, so what are you working on? Never say anything. <laughs> say, well, you know, it's just same old, same old. Because other actors just don't want to hear if you have good things happening to you. That's sadly true. Uh, but uh, I think we, it's true with everybody. A, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it becomes an unintended reflection on someone else's lack of success. And, and, and this is one of the, the delightful things I learned about the book. When you act, uh -huh. when you act, everybody always said, yeah, but Stephen, wouldn't you want one of those leading characters? You know, you always play those third and fourth and fifth and occasionally mm -hmm. second characters. And, 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 you know, there's always something someone throws at you to make you feel dissatisfied with your journey. People do this with the book all the time. So I've written two books of stories uh -huh. and people always come up to me and go, Stephen, the stories in your book, you ought to turn those into a screenplay. <laughs> and I go like, <laughs> because that is a hole in the ground you don't want to crawl in. So I know there's nothing worse than writing a screenplay. If there's anyone out there writing screenplays, don't do it. If you could possibly <laughs> help yourself, don't write a screenplay. It, it's everyone, you know, and there is nothing better than writing your stories. There's nothing better than embracing your life and embracing your stories and nothing worse than turning them into a Just screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worse. But I've learned that. The people, and I appreciate you coming on and well, thank you. talking to My me. My pleasure. Um, where can everybody find you? What social media? Where are you at? Uh, well, there's the Tobolowski Files. I have uh -huh. a website, which is stephentobolowski.com, in which it'll point you in the direction of the podcast uh -huh. if you can't find them. That's it'll... right. We didn't mention your podcast. You're, you're all over. I'll leave all the links down yeah, there. Yeah, Stephen... Uh, if right now there's so many different websites that uh -huh. play the podcast, if you just go on just Google go to, and go Tobolowski Files, they'll, it'll come up. Yeah. All right. So Google, just Google. Google. Uh, yeah, yeah. Certainly, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Stephen Tobolowski or at Tobolowski on Twitter, and uh, then Tobolowski Files, my two books, and uh, go to my website stephentobolowski.com. And I'll tell you my appearances because I go different places all over the... And do you teach a class on a regular basis? I, no. It's uh, just you offer class. And if they follow you? It's through Kalmanson and Kalmanson. Okay. When I have time, I usually do either an improv or a comedy uh -huh. class. Like this year, I was able to do one. Uh-huh. You know, next year, I'm trying to do one in January. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, you know, because I usually don't have time. My advice to you is stalk him and get in his class if you can, um, and and watch his stuff, read his stuff. Um, I, you, I feel like I've grown and uh, learned a lot from your books and enjoy talking to you just because you're cool. And watch one but, day at a time. Oh yeah. Watch one day at a time. And well, Merrick's great. even on one 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 Merrick's episode. Merrick's on one day yeah. at a time. Yeah. And it's one of the greatest shows. On Did you see a TV Guide list as one of the top twenty five really? shows? Someone lists as the number one show on Netflix. I mean, it, it's like we're getting, you gotta see one day at a time if you haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, um, Samantha, my 14 year old, and I started watching it, and then Merrick was on, and he called from set. And he's like, Who didn't tell me Steven was on this? <laughs> oh my God, I walked on set, and there was Steven. So he, he was excited to see a familiar face. You know, yes. how it is she going? Yeah, he did that's, that's cool. Yay! All right, guys, so make sure that you follow me, make sure you follow him, and I hope that you got um, some amazing tips and inspiration out of this video. Most importantly, have an amazing week, and I'll see you next week. All right, we did it. <laughs>